Amen. Thank you, Janice. As I've said many times over and over in the past, uh, she's my better half. She's my animation. If you couldn't tell that from that little announcement giving, you would know that to be true of the case, very much so. Uh, good morning, everybody. You know, that last song that we sang, uh, the chorus, the refrain, what can I say, what can I do, but offer this heart, offer my heart to you, O oh God, for what you've done because of what you've done. I heard a quote this week. I read a quote also, the same quote. I read it in another instance. It says, it's this. It goes, it's by C.T. Studd, who was a missionary in uh, China, uh, India, and Africa in the late 1800s. He said this, If Jesus Christ be God and he died for me, no sacrifice that I make is too great. And we're going to be kind of talking about that a little bit this morning, but I think it's fitting um, as we get into that, as we get into our text. Now, the logistics here are going to be crazy because things are blowing all over the place, um, but that's all right. Well, good morning. In case you don't know, my name is Jamie Halverson. I have the privilege um, and the an immense responsibility to serve as an elder, one of the elders here at Harvest. So I'm glad that you were able to join with us this morning here at Harvest. A couple weeks ago, Janice and I watched a show. We were in Spokane at the time. We watched a show called Alone. It's one of these survivor kind of type shows, right? The premise of the show is they get 10 people and they put them off on a deserted island. In this case, it was Vancouver Island. And they separate them so they can't have inner, inner contact with one another. And um, they're to live off the land for as long as they can. They, get, they have no supplies. They have to do their own filming of, of themselves. And so they've, they've learned how to do that um, so they can document this whole event. Uh, and so it's just amazing the things that they go through, the things that they learn to do to, to fend for themselves, basically. Uh, we watched this thing, and the winter lasted, I think it was 63 days or something like that, something like that. The one, one guy, he tapped out within the first four hours. I don't know what his deal was. He just thought, I, I, he, he went into it all confident, and he's like, I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this happen. Four hours later, he's like, nope, I'm out. Anyways, unless you've been living like that recently, you would realize that the world we're now living in is crazy. It's just, we didn't see this coming. Four or five months ago, you know, we were all doing our thing. But God has a different plan often than ours. And so, um, as I've been thinking about what I was going to be preaching on this morning, uh, this particular passage kept coming back to my mind. And so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't run from it any longer. And hopefully it will be a challenge to you. It's not necessarily um, the most difficult passage to understand, but yet it is challenging. And it was challenging for me as well. So with that in mind, take your Bibles or your phones and turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 is where we're going to be this morning. Let me pray as you're turning there. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. For it is a light into our path. Lord, we, we need it desperately. We need it even more so in these times that we're facing right now. We need to hear from you. We need to be changed by your word, encouraged by your word, challenged, corrected. Lord, would you take this time, would you take your words, would you put them into our minds and into our hearts, more importantly, that we might be able to put them into practice. And so we thank you for this, your word, this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I would imagine that most of us here have, at some point or other, have taken on a project, or we've decided to go on vacation. Like I just mentioned, Janice and I, a couple weeks ago, were in Spokane. You've taken on a project, you, you've decided you're going to do something, so the first thing you do is you sit down and you figure out what you're going to need. 
how much it might cost, right? If you're going on a vacation like we did, we, I'm self-employed, so I gotta weigh the, the, the factor of how long are we gonna be gone? What are we gonna do when we get there? How much, we're going to see our grandkids, so you know there's gonna be a lot of money flowing to, to make them happy and to be with them, and that's all good. But nonetheless, you have to count the cost. You have, to, you have to plan for what you might be doing. Because the last thing you want to do, especially on a project of some sort, is get halfway through and you can't finish because you look like a fool. You think, one of the times in Spokane, one of the first times that we drove up there, there was a, somebody building a house or a, I think a garage to their house and just had the studs showing. And I thought, okay, they're in the middle of doing that. Well, the next time we went up, a year later, or six months later, same condition. And the next time, a year later, same condition. Now it's starting to look run down and ratty and ragged. It's like, man, what are they, what's going on? What are they doing? You know, you just think, you just, those kind of thoughts go through your mind about not counting the cost properly. Before we get into this passage, I want to I set a foundation with a couple of other passages. And it, it's out of, one's out of John chapter 6 and one um, out of Acts. In John chapter 6, we see Jesus and his disciples and a crowd of people that, is, that have gathered and followed him, are following him, them. And Jesus says this almost to the end of John chapter, John chapter 6. He says, I'm the bread of life. I am the living bread, he says. He goes on to say, I'm not going to read the whole passage. I thought I was going to read the whole passage, but it's, it's several verses. But I'm just going to kind of hit the highlight spots. He goes on to say in uh, John 6, 56, he says, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Well, this is kind of interesting uh, for them to understand and Further down, it says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you are to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are, Spirit and life. But there were some of you who do not believe. And then he says, um, verse 65, it says, And this is why I said that no one can come to me unless the Father has granted it to him. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, what about you? Do you want to leave as well? Peter, imagine that, steps up. And he brings it into some clarity. He says, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe that you are come from God, from the Father, the Holy One of God. Peter, counting the cost, understanding what is going on, knows that there's no other way. Keep that in mind as we, as we get into our text this morning. We'll, re, we'll revisit that in a bit. The next one is in Acts chapter 21. Not too long ago, we studied Acts and we came across this passage. Paul's on his way to Jerusalem. He's in Caesarea. He's staying at the house of Philip the Evangelist. And a prophet named Agabus from Judea comes and he says this. And coming to us, Luke records, he took Paul's belt and bound his feet and his hands and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And Luke says, when we heard this, we and the people urged him, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And Paul says this. 
What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am not, I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He's counting the cost. If you can't, if you haven't caught the theme, that's what we're going for this morning. Counting the cost. Paul would later write to the Philippians in Philippi, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I just wanted to throw those out there for us this morning because it's going to help us as we, as we look at our passage this morning in, in Luke. So let's go there. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25. I'm just going to go to verse 33. Let me read this. You follow along as I read, and then we'll get into this this morning. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish all will see it and begin to mock him, saying, this man man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king of war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able to, with 10,000, to meet him who has come against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. There's a theme there, obviously. The big idea this morning is this. Devotion to Jesus has no limits. Devotion to Jesus has no limits. Point number one is simply this. Devotion to Jesus means total sacrifice of everything. Say that again, total sacrifice of everything. Devotion to Jesus means total sacrifice of everything. Look at verse 26. It says this, If anyone comes after me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Now remember, he's got this large crowd following him and he turns to them and he says this right out of the gate we're taken aback by these words I mean after all we're told prior to love our enemies right we're told to honor our fathers and our mothers We're told to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To raise our children in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. Now Jesus is saying in order to follow him we must hate those closest to us. Even our own lives. So turn to your family and tell them you hate them. No, I'm just kidding. As I was thinking this through, I thought, you know what? I'm going to ask some other folks 
what they think about this. I have, Janice and I have two sons and a daughter. Our two sons are both pastors, so I often will call them and get their take on a particular passage. And that's helpful. They are able to steer me in a right direction if I'm wandering off or, or confirm what I'm already thinking. As I said, we were in Spokane a couple of weeks ago, and I thought, you know, I'm going to ask one other person about this passage. And uh, as Bill talked about last week, uh, faith of children is so simple and yet so direct sometimes. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to ask my granddaughter. She's eight years old. Look we'll at her take on this. Now, mind you, this is the same girl who, when she was four, I believe, we were coming home from somewhere in the car, and she bursts out with this. She said, did you know that the church is the bride of Christ? Like, what? You're four years old. What is, how, you know, her dad's a pastor. Well, what do you know? What do you, what do you expect? So I... I approached Finley and I said, Finley, I got a question for you. Do you know what it means to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus? Do you know what he expects of us? And then I went on and I told her, you know, what Jesus says is that in order to be a follower of his, we have to hate our fathers and mothers. And she was shocked. She was taken aback. What? I can't be. Yeah, and I said, not only that, we have to hate our wives and our children. And she just got more and more, I don't know, just shocked. And, and we have to hate our brothers and sisters. She was just beside herself. She didn't know. She said, that can't be right. I said, well, what are we supposed to do, Finley? She goes, we're supposed to love them. Hmm, okay. Yeah, we're supposed to love them. Yeah. But who are we supposed to love more? And she thought for just a moment, and she said, Jesus. Well, that's exactly right. We're supposed to love Jesus more. In fact, the word here in this text this morning for hate means to love less. Love less. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, he, he records it this way. Whoever, speaking of Jesus, Jesus talking, says, whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What Jesus is saying to his disciples, to be a disciple, he has to love him so much that disciple, that disciple's love for Jesus is to be so great that any earthly love in comparison is hate, is deemed as being hateful. You understand what I'm saying? So the love for Christ is way up here. Your love for your family is down here, but those looking on think, well, they don't really love them that much. The listing of those nearest and dearest to us shows us just how serious our devotion to Christ must be. Not only that, he's telling us that we're not even to put much stock in our own lives. The problem that we face today is this, that we, and we wouldn't admit this probably to one another, Oftentimes, what we're trying to do is make our best life or have our best life now. We get caught up in the culture and what it's telling us, the, the list of things that we must have, the right job, the right place to live, where to buy a house, all that kind of stuff, so that we'll be happy and fulfilled, right? But that's not what Jesus is telling us. He's telling us that cross-bearing is the essence of, of discipleship. In verse 27, he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And what we picture here is that, 
is that of a condemned man going and being forced to take his cross to his place of execution. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. No, a disciple of Christ does so willingly. He voluntarily and willingly takes on the pain, the shame, and persecution himself, just as Jesus did for you and I. Not only that, not only does he do that, but he's willing to do it daily. And of course, this is only, (laughs) we're only able to do this by the power of, and strength of the Holy Spirit, not by some strength that we've worked up in ourselves, but it comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Several years ago, I attended a conference in Minneapolis, a Desiring God conference, and the theme of the conference was the perseverance or the endurance of the saints. One of the speakers was uh, a missionary lady. Her name was Helen Rosevere. I think at the time she was 81. She had served in Africa. And um, I just want to read, because I can't relay it as powerful as what she, her own words, say it. She came to, she came to know of God at a young age. Um, I think was 12 years old. But there was something that wasn't connecting. She would read scripture. She would, she would study and try and pray, but it, there, was, there was something that was missing until she got to college. And while at college, she was attending a, um, a gathering with other students. It was around Christmas time, and she got into an argument with somebody in, in a fight, not a fist fight, but a verbal fight. She went upstairs just distraught and didn't know what to do, crying on her bed. She looked up and she saw the verse, uh, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. And right then, it clicked for her. Because of all the scriptures she had read, all the time that she had spent, but yet felt disconnected, in that moment it connected with her. She came down the stairs and she relayed that story to those people in the room. And they were, it was a Bible study and they were talking about spiritual things. And this is what she writes. She says, and God was not done working. When Helen rejoined the group and told them what had happened, a veteran Bible teacher Um, conveyed to her Philippians 3.10. He wrote this verse in her Bible. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made comfortable, or I mean conformable unto his death. She writes this. He said to me, tonight you've entered into the first part of that verse, that I may know him. This is only the beginning There's a long journey ahead. My prayer for you is that you will go on through the verse to know the power of his resurrection and also, God willing, one day perhaps the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Helen went back to her room that night and read the verse in its context. And so on that very day that God drew her to himself, he also showed her his words that 20 years later would give meaning to the most painful, seemingly irrational event in her whole life. Here's the event. One night, one October night in 1964, her house was raided. She's in Africa, remember. The people destroyed and ransacked and plundered. She, was, she tried to escape. She was battered, beaten, and her back teeth knocked out. With a gun pressed to her throbbing head, she prayed that God would just please let her die. When all the men except one had left, that one caught her, raped her, and arrested her. 
She writes movingly how abandoned she felt that night. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His answer to her was a removal of the fear as it had been uh, rinsed out of her and a strong sense of his arms around her, holding her and comforting her. She felt as if it were saying, when I called you to myself, I called you to the fellowship of my suffering. They are not attacking you. They are attacking me. I'm just using your body to show myself to the people around you. Over the next 10 weeks, Helen, with various other people and held in several different places, including a convent, one young nun had been raped and felt that she betrayed God and her promises to God. Because of her similar experience, Helen was able to break that woman's despairing barrier as no one else could. And just before her rescue, rebel soldiers were starting at one end of the large room, taking women away one by one and bringing them back after they had finished with them. Helen's first impulse was to hide and not bear this humiliation again. Then she thought of Jesus. He put himself forward as a substitute for us, the fellowship of his sufferings. She moved to the front to try to protect some of the other women from undergoing a new trauma they might possibly have, es have escaped so far. She looked back later on this whole period and wrote, we learned why God has given us his name as I am. His grace always proved itself sufficient in the moment of need, but never before the, necessity, the necessary time. As I anticipated suffering in my Im imagination and thought of what these cruel soldiers would do next, I quivered with fear. But when the moment came for action, he filled me with a peace and an assurance about what to say or do that amazed me and often defeated and intimidated, uh, I'm sorry, and often defeated the immediate tactics of the enemy. This is willingly taking up your cross. This is willingly placing yourself in harm's way. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is renouncing all others that he or she has and following Jesus no matter where it might lead. You see, devotion to Jesus is a lifelong commitment. Earthly wards are not in view. Rewards will come at the resurrection. That we can be sure on. That we can rest in and know that to be true. Point number two would be this, simply. Devotion to Jesus means counting the cost because you can't afford not to. You can't afford not to look at, see what Jesus is about what he has for you. In verses 28 through 32, Jesus gives us two little mini parables in regards to counting the cost. They are similar yet different. The first one in verse 28, he says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all who see it mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Pretty self-explanatory, is it not? Jesus uses this idea of counting the cost uh, to build a tower. Oh, there we go. Hold that thought. He uses this uh, of building a tower and we've all witnessed it. Someone is on fire for the Lord, have we not? We've all witnessed that moment of conversion, or so-called conversion. They're on fire for the Lord, but as time, the fire fades. And pretty soon, there's no fire at all. Jesus is saying, count the cost. There's no such thing as half-hearted discipleship. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, says this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. He refers to the idea of half-hearted following Christ as cheap grace. Again, he says, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. So we're to count the cost, to take everything into consideration. Then Jesus gives us a similar parable in verses 31 and 32. He says, Or what king going out to encounter another king in war would not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able to, with 10,000, come and meet him and defeat him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Well, again, it's pretty straightforward, counting the cost, weighing out the options that we have. The two parables are similar, but yet slightly different. In the first one, we see that the builder of the tower has the freedom to choose whether to build or not. He can decide. He can, as he weighs out the cost of what it's going to take, he can say, you know what, I don't have what it takes. I'm going to wait. He's free to choose. The king, however, He's got to make a decision now. He's got to decide what he's going to do. He has to do something. Again, in the first one, you sit down, you take a moment to see if you can afford to follow Jesus, is what he's saying. In the second parable, it's sit down and cost, count the cost and see whether or not you can refuse to follow his demands. In other words, count the cost because you can't afford not to. And what Jesus is saying here is plain. He does not want followers to rush into discipleship without understanding what's at cost, what's at stake. It's pretty clear. He's pretty clear about the cost. It will cost you everything. Everything that you hold dear, everything that you're hanging on to that you think is going to fulfill and, and satisfy you. But what does he say? If you do that, if you put those things ahead of me, you cannot be my disciple. Those are hard words to, to swallow. Those are hard words to sometimes make sense of. Remember in John, that passage in John, all those who were following so-called disciples following Jesus. When they heard about the eating of the flesh and drinking the blood, and I'm sure the other things that, that they heard along the way, all the while they're thinking and counting the cost. And they got to a point and said, this is too hard. Can't do it. And they walked away. Peter along with all these folks and the other disciples, heard the same words. And when he counted the cost, he said this, where else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. He counted the cost. He didn't know at that time what it would really cost him. In verse 33, he ends this way. So therefore, anyone who, of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Three times in this passage, Jesus says these words, cannot be my disciple. First one is in the first verse. Unless you hate those you love. 
Unless you love me more than those, you cannot be my disciple. And then he says it again. If you're not taking up your own cross, if you're not willingly sacrificing for others, you cannot be my disciple. And then here he says, if you're not willing to renounce all that you have, in case there's any question, you cannot be my disciple. Again, hard words to listen to, hard words to hear. And yet my prayer for us is this. As I've been thinking about this, I could easily stand in front of the mirror and and repeat these words to myself and did. Because it's, it's getting to a place of all this doesn't matter, folks. Yeah, I'm thankful we can gather together and be outside, but at the end of the day, what we need to be about is reaching the lost. Sacrificing to do so. And like what was told to Helen Roosevelt, my prayer for us, and it's a dangerous prayer, I understand. In fact, you can go through the history of missionaries in the past, missionaries that we know of. I have a daughter and a son-in-law who are about to embark on their goal, their believe the Lord leading them to be missionaries. And it's not in a very friendly place. It's in the top 10 places that are hostile to Christianity. And so for them, they have to count the cost. Now, do they love us more than they love the gospel? No. Do they love Christ more than they love Janice and I? Absolutely. And I wouldn't want to hold them back Let me say it this way. As a father, I don't want him to go. But as a believer, as a brother in Christ, I want to send them and uphold them and be with them and be for them. My prayer is this, that we would sit down and count the cost, praying that you would be found in him, that we would be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that we may be found, that we may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by all means possible, we would, we would attain the resurrection from the dead. As I was thinking about This morning, I thought, what a great time it would be for us to partake in the Lord's Supper. So we're going to do that. And while Hunter comes, and we're going to sing a song of preparation. And what I want us to do is take that time to, well, the words of Jesus here, count the cost. Count the cost on what it is means to be a follower of Jesus. Or maybe you think you're a follower of Jesus and maybe you're really not. We have to weigh this out. Sometimes we can go through the motions and think that we're all good. And one of the passages in the Bible that gives me great pause is in Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. If that doesn't take you aback, I don't know what will. So what we want to do here at this time is we sing this song. We have two tables that have communion, the communion elements on them. They're all self-contained. So take those. Now, the little top is a little bit tricky to take off, so just take a moment and get that bread wafer out um, as we're singing, as you're reflecting on communion. Now, the beautiful part about this is um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives us instructions on communion. He gives us a warning. He says, don't partake in an unworthy manner. The beautiful thing about 
having a time of reflection is that we can get straight with the Lord. It doesn't take hours and hours. We can repent and be ready to go. And God is able and will forgive us right then. And then we're able to take partake in communion. Um, so as we sing, maybe one or one one person from your group go up and grab a cup and take it back to your 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 uh, people. And um, when the song is over, we'll partake together.